want to set the table or sitting back? Um, if you could sit at the table, then we can still at the tables. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go ahead and get started. I expect we'll have others uh, trickle in over the next few minutes. I uh, appreciate you braving what I take to be a rather chilly afternoon. I haven't been out since early this morning, but I suspect uh, it's nearly as cold now as it was uh, first thing this morning. So we're particularly delighted um, to see you. Um, I'm Bob Hathaway. I direct the Asia program. I'm here at the Wilson Center. Uh, we don't do nearly as much on Southeast Asia um, as I wish we did or as we ought to do, and so we're particularly pleased to be hosting this event uh, today. Uh, we're doubly pleased, or even triply pleased, uh, because uh, not only are we doing a topic that we don't do a great deal on, uh, but we are acting as host to one of our own, so to speak. Um, Alistair Bowie is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, this year, uh, pursuing research on the topic about which he'll speak today. And it's always uh, gratifying to us to give one of our fellows something of a public forum. And, and so, as I say, we're especially uh, delighted uh, to be hosting this today. Um, Alistair, in addition to being a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, um, is also an associate professor of political science at George Washington University here in town. Um, he has studied widely in Southeast Asia, traveled extensively, lived there, and written about uh, many of the countries in the region. Uh, by my perhaps incomplete count. I know that he has written about Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Um, once he decided to undertake this project, uh, which is a comparative uh, examination of decentralization and democracy in Indonesia and Vietnam, um, he then went out and started learning the Vietnamese language. Um, as someone who routinely stumbles over the English language, uh, the fact that someone, Alistair, I hope I can say someone beyond 30 years old, um, <laughs> takes up a brand new language uh, is uh, pretty intimidating uh, to me. Um, so, um, Alistair, we are, of course, delighted to be sponsoring this, and we look forward to hearing from you, and I turn things over to you. Thanks, Bob. I'd like to say thank you to the Asia Program uh, to Bob and particularly to Amy Thinstrom for setting up this event and to the Wilson Center in general for providing a friendly and supportive environment during the period of my fellowship here. Thanks too to Dave Timberman who's agreed to be commentator for this event and to Aaron Kruth, my assistant, uh, who helped prepare the tables and uh, slides that you're going to see in the presentation. And thank you all for coming. I apologize for my voice. I'm recovering from a cold. I'm a lot better than my voice sounds. The focus of my talk today is the interplay of two transformations, decentralization and democratization. And I'm going to use the experiences of regions within two countries of Southeast Asia, <coughs> Vietnam and Indonesia, to illustrate my findings. My research question has to do with our preconceptions about how government reform and political transitions to democracy work in developing countries. How does the advent of democracy bear upon the process of bringing power to the people through devolution of central government authority to subnational units of government, i.e. decentralization? You'll get some sense of my answer to this question if I start with a story or two. I arrived in the Indonesian district of Sidoarjo on the outskirts of East Java near the commercial hub of Surabaya in July last year with high expectations for the success of decentralization in that district. On previous visits I'd witnessed its business outreach. I had earlier in the year attended an expo at the provincial governor's formal reception hall where Sidoarjo vied with some 12 other districts from East Java to demonstrate the capabilities of its one-stop shop website and its officials hawked colorful, colorful brochures and how-to booklets to potential investors. I'd witnessed its easy access via toll road to the port and the airport 
um, in meetings with officials on the executive side of the district government, I'd learned about their hopes to attract a foreign investor to build a four-star hotel and entertainment center near the center of the district capital town. But the mood was tense in the coffee shop of the two-star hotel as I sat down with civil society activists and officials breaking for lunch from a seminar on transparency in budgetary planning. This was not perhaps surprising, as prosecutors had just days before indicted the three top leaders of the elected district legislature on charges of corruption involving the misuse of the previous, uh, the previous year of no less than 40 percent of the 2003 annual budget for the district. The officials in the room were no doubt wary because their bosses, senior officials in the district executive's office, had undoubtedly been complicit in authorizing the release of these funds to the legislature following highly unorthodox procedures, knowing in all likelihood that this money was going to be absconded with by the legislators. Clearly, when democracy came to Sidwarjo, it made the task of the district executive in seeking to wield the authority granted him under Indonesia's decentralization to attract revenue generating and job creating businesses to his jurisdiction considerably more challenging. Funds that might have gone to improving the heavily overused local roads to, re to build <coughs> industrial parks, there are none in the district at the moment, or have been used to offer incentives to attract foreign investment, there is little currently offered, had gone instead into the pockets of leaders of the party factions in the legislature and their followers. These legislators in turn were undoubtedly driven not simply by personal greed, but also by the imperative bred of democratic Indonesia's centralized party political system that they funnel significant funds upwards to their central party organizations in Jakarta in order to guarantee that their names would appear on the, their party list for the legislative election that was held in April 2004. Now the specific case of Sidwarjo points to my general findings. Democracy, when viewed up close at the subnational level, ain't what you think it is. I hope to leave you with a clear sense that our expectations of what national level democracy can do for people at the district level are not necessarily borne out. <clears throat> the implications that I'll develop in more detail towards the end of my talk are that in designing and implementing development assistance programs for developing countries, whether in the area of economic reform, government reform, or democracy assistance, we'd be well advised to anticipate the sometimes confounding effects that democracy and democratization can have on local government performance. I'll not underplay democracy's contributions. I'm not about to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I will suggest ways in which democratization at the subnational level may be strengthened and made more compatible with programs designed to support the decentralization of government authority. <coughs> to balance the snapshot that I've just given you from Sidwarajo, I'd like to recall for you another that bears on our a priori expectations for decentralization, this time from provincial Vietnam. Vietnam's long history of structured Mandarin-like rule, whether from China or in more recent times from central or northern Vietnam, and the post-World War II history of central control from the, central, from the Vietnam Communist Party, first in the north and then for the last three decades throughout the country as a whole, when combined with the comparatively compact nature of the country, certainly in comparison with sprawling Indonesia, not to mention the legacy of three wars of national liberation, leads us to expect, expect Vietnamese provincial executives and party secretaries to be very cautious adherents to the central line. Especially in the north, in the shadow of the capital, we'd expect them to respond to decentralization with suspicion and to defer to the central party leadership rather than to go out on a limb to seize upon and exploit new powers allowed by decentralization laws. I had these thoughts in mind as I was ushered into the large receiving room to meet the vice chair of the People's Committee in the provincial <coughs> town of Haizum, capital of Haizum province, that sits about 90 minutes drive east of Hanoi in this general area, astride the national highway and the main railway line to the port of Haiphong. <coughs> 
with its tall ceilings, elaborate wall and ceiling carvings, heavy, dark and excruciatingly uncomfortable furniture. It suggests a miniature version of the Taihua Palace, the Palace of Supreme Harmony in the imperial enclosure in Hue, central Vietnam, where 19th century Win emperors of Vietnam received official delegations and performed court ceremonies. An uninformed observer who happened to follow me around in the course of that morning <coughs> might have arrived at the conclusion that I was being dissed by a provincial government apparatus in lockstep with ever watchful nearby Hanoi. Count the number of people in the initial receiving room, apart from myself, my Hanoi counterpart and an interpreter we'd brought with us, there were no more than three other people in this very large room. A more typical number, as I learned from an average province, was at least eight and on my visit to southern province Long An, a case of unsuccessful decentralization, 20. Pretty soon we were handed off to the deputy head of the province's industrial zones authority for a meeting with a couple of others, and within about an hour we were with quite a junior, although knowledgeable, expert official, bumping along the dusty, still unfinished roads of one of the province's two new industrial zones and braving the cool late autumn wind to explore with this official on foot, some of the sites that had been snapped up by foreign investors within the zone. The uninformed observer would not have been privy to two insights that I developed from my observation and experience of provincial government. The first, the fewer the people in the first prearranged meeting and the shorter this formal gatekeeping meeting, the more successful the provincial government is likely to be in attracting business and investment. The quicker, the second, the quicker I'm handed off to lower level officials who actually know the nuts and bolts of what is going on and are eager to share documents in both Vietnamese and English, which, is itself, which in itself signals something significant, then the more successful the provincial government is likely to be in attracting <coughs> business and investment. As exemplified in this uh, 1843 Chinese trading map, Vietnam has for many centuries been highly penetrated by foreign trade and investment ties. I was just the latest in a long string of visitors seeking information about local rules and rulers and about the prevailing conditions for trade and investment. My visit was a proxy for how the provincial government treated potential investors. The fewer ranking officials were likely to be stacked into the initial meeting room and the lower the level of official with whom I was permitted to interact on my visits, the more comfortable the provincial government was with such visitors and in its success at handling them. The Haizung provincial officials clearly saw me as a potential source of information about markets and potential investors, possibly even involved in business myself or knowing someone who was, rather than as a source of trouble from their higher ups. Although historically, geographically, and institutional factors would lead us to expect limited success from decentralization, especially in northern Vietnam, Haizung is a successful example of a province whose government has been aggressive, innovative, and highly successful in creating conditions attractive to new investment. Although these are just two examples, they do give you, I hope, a bit of the flavor for the context in which I've done my research and some of the senses of the ways in which decentralization is unfolding in both democratizing and non-democratizing settings. To understand and explain variation in the success of decentralization in different country settings, one needs to get beyond macro comparisons of one country with another and instead to look in detail at samples of specific cases of provincial and district governments. That's what my research does. My research also contributes to a better understanding of the neglected side of democratization, namely, what is democracy good for and what is it not good for, i.e. the consequences of democratization. Last October in this room, a workshop was held to commemorate the 20th anniversary of a very influential project that originated here at the Wilson Center. And the four books that resulted from that project are known collectively under the title Transitions from Authoritarian Rule. The project assessed the possibilities and mechanisms that might exist for countries of Latin America and elsewhere 
to escape the authoritarianism of the 1960s and 1970s. Now, 20 years later, many of the looked for transitions from authoritarian rule have occurred and the focus of scholarship on the politics of developing countries has moved from the potentials for transition to describing and analyzing the process of democratization, then democratic consolidation in the developing world. Now among those invited to participate in this workshop, Kurt Whelan, the professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin, observed that for all the focus on the inputs necessary for successful democratic regime change to come to pass, what you got out of democracy, the policy results of democratic systems, were too rarely assessed. In this regard, he laid out a number of questions whose answers we don't yet know. How does democratization affect the processes of public policy making and its results? Does the advent of democratically elected legislative bodies make the policy making process more inclusive? And does democratization strengthen or weaken the administrative capacity of official institutions to implement public policy decisions in substantive areas. This is where my research on Vietnam and Indonesia fits into the big picture. My findings highlight the unanticipated results when democratization takes place in tandem with the transformation of government by means of decentralization. I explore these results at the subnational level by looking specifically at provincial governments in Vietnam and district government in Indonesia. I compare policy making processes under decentralization in provincial <coughs> Vietnam, uncomplicated by democratic transition, with the same processes in the case of district Indonesia where decentralization is being accompanied by democratization. The substantive policy areas I focus on relate to the attracting and encouragement of private enterprises and investment. I assess the processes of local government in these issue areas using a structured small sample of five Indonesian districts, three in Java, two in Sulawesi, and another sample of four comparable districts in Vietnam, spanning the three main regions. Now, at first blush, comparing Vietnam and Indonesia may seem a stretch. Vietnam has less than one-fifth the land area of Indonesia. It has one-third of Indonesia's population and is a great deal less diverse e ethnically. However, if we look at the national profiles of Vietnam and Indonesia along dimensions relevant to this research, we find these two developing countries share not only a common region but also have a remarkably similar level of development and a similar sectoral profile. In terms of GDP per capita mentioned, uh, measured in purchasing power parity terms in 2003, Vietnam's GDP is $2,500, Indonesia's $3,200. Neighbor Thailand has GDP of $7,400. In terms of quality of life of the Vietnamese and Indonesian populations, including health and education, they're remarkably similar. Their scores on the United Nations Development Human Development Index could hardly be closer. Vietnam scores 112, Indonesia 111. And neighbors, Philippines and Thailand actually lag at 83 and 76. If we look at educational attainment, the percentage literacy in both countries is almost the same. 90% in Vietnam, 88% in Indonesia. The levels of primary enrollment are almost identical, 94% and 92%. And the proportion of children who once enrolled in grade one graduate in grade five is identical, 89%. <coughs> the industrial sector <coughs> contributes nearly 40% of Vietnam's GDP, 44% of Indonesia's. Both countries are oil and gas exporters, and agriculture accounts for 23% of Vietnam's GDP, while a little less, 17% in the case of Indonesia. Both countries are perceived to be, have relatively high levels of corruption. Out of 145 countries listed in Transparency's International's 2004 assessment, Vietnam ranks 102nd, Indonesia 133rd. Thailand, by comparison, ranks, ranks 64th. And both countries have political pasts that have been authoritarian. In the case of Vietnam, less authoritarian than now, sorry, more authoritarian than now, both, in this sense, can be said to be in transition from authoritarian rule, although the levels at which democracy is being permitted 
and the extent to which each country may be said to be democratic very greatly. If arrayed along a continuum of such countries in transition towards political liberalism, Vietnam would be almost at the opposite end to Indonesia. In any case, what I hope I've established from this brief dip into the data is that Vietnam and Indonesia are at very s a similar level of development and that it's valid to compare their experience of decentralization despite their disparate population and geographic sizes. Now, if I'm to compare the effects of decentralization in both countries, what do I mean by decentralization? I define it as a conscious and deliberate program enshrined in law or constitutional amendment for transferring authority over some aspects of government from central government to subnational units of government. Now, decentralization is typically a series of processes undertaken in response to a number of imperatives. These imperatives are reflected in the variety of forms that decentralization can take, affecting various levels of subnational government in different ways. In content, decentralization usually encompasses both administrative and fiscal changes. Decentralization on a nationwide level began in Vietnam and Indonesia with legal and constitutional changes adopted in 1999 and implemented in 2000 and 2001. These programs were initiated against the background of long histories of centralized government. There had been limited cases of de facto and partial decentralization since the early 1990s, often clustered in provinces or districts known as fence breakers or those chosen to participate in pilot programs funded by multilateral agencies such as the World Bank. Nationwide decentralization, on the other hand, was a new thing. What forms has decentralization taken in Vietnam and Indonesia, and in what senses are the decentralization programs comparable? If you look at table one, uh, displayed on the screen and in your handout, um, this shows the actual implementation of administrative and fiscal decentralization, i.e. what does it look like on the ground at the provincial level in Vietnam or the district level in Indonesia. To give you an idea of what's going on concurrently in terms of political transition, I've included in the far right-hand panel um, an assessment of progress witnessed in bringing democ democratic government to the provincial or district level. First, let's look at the left-hand side of the table, the administrative decentralization. Um, you'll see listed uh, several aspects of administrative decentralization, such as the authority to hire and fire government officials, the authority to contract, and regulatory authority. So these are the first three columns. Um, the final column is an overall assessment comparing Vietnam and Indonesia. It's not additive. The first three columns don't add to the fourth column. Uh, but this is to give you a sense of what the overall assessment is of, of how decentralized is administrative decentralization in these two countries. You'll see that um, in the second and third column uh, in terms of contracting authority and also uh, regulatory authority, uh, the um, uh, experiences of Vietnam and Indonesia are quite similar. Uh, in terms of hiring and firing, uh, uh, there are certain constraints on hiring and firing both in law and in practice, so it's a mixed story for both. And the overall assessment is that there are, there are relatively high levels of administrative decentralization in Indonesia, uh, medium level in Vietnam. Now turning to fiscal decentralization in the middle uh, section, um, this relates to uh, things like control over the tax base and rating authority. Um, whether the budget comes mostly from local sources or from the central government, whether the local or the district or the province has borrowing authority or not, um, and whether it has responsibility for providing municipal services or for health and education and welfare, HEW. Um, and lastly, whether the uh, district or provincial government has overall planning authority. Um, if you look uh, in the central panel, uh, in, in the first uh, two uh, columns, you'll see uh, similarity in, in the case of both uh, provinces in Vietnam and districts in, in uh, Indonesia. 
uh, on the negative side in, in the sense that they do not enjoy the ability to set the tax base or the rate of taxation for things like VAT or income tax. Uh, and in both cases, the budget predominantly comes, their budget predominantly comes from the central government. If you look at uh, central of uh, the responsibility for municipal services, uh, column four, you'll see that there are similarities there too. In both cases, the uh, district and provincial governments are responsible for providing um, municipal services, and they also have, in column six, um, authority over planning uh, for their districts. There are uh, some areas under fiscal decentralization where there are differences uh, between the decentralization witnessed in Vietnam and that in Indonesia. Um, I'll just mention in terms of borrowing authority, uh, Indonesian borrowing, district borrowing is much more prescribed than in Vietnam. Um, also in terms of uh, responsibility of health, education and welfare, uh, whereas Indonesian districts have responsibility for these uh, social services, uh, these are still controlled from the center in Vietnam. The overall assessment in both cases is a, a medium level of fiscal uh, decentralization in, in both countries. So with this table, um, what I mean to demonstrate is that in terms of the economic aspect of decentralization, uh, largely that encapsulated under administrative um, uh, regulatory authority, contracting authority, um, but also under fiscal decentralization, under planning autonomy. Um, the reform <coughs> programs as implemented are quite similar in both Vietnam and Indonesia. While the level to which authority has been passed is different to the provinces in Vietnam but to the districts in Indonesia, these units are rather comparable in size and population, although there's caused considerable variation within each country among provinces and among districts. While the sect sectoral scope of the national decentralization is taken as a whole, is different. Indonesia's Big Bang decentralization is much more comprehensive, while Vietnam's more limited is more limited with its focus on economic conditions for private enterprise. Because I've focused my research on economic decision making and the behavior of subnational governments in this substantive issue area, the decentralization implemented under Vietnam's enterprise law is comparable with those aspects of Indonesia's decentralization laws that passed economic decision making to subnational governments in that country. Now let me talk about uh, democratization. At almost the same time as it began its decentralization, Indonesia began on a course of rapid democratization following the forcing from power in 1998 of the 32 year autocratic ruler President Suharto. With an unprecedented four nationwide elections held in the past five years, each of which I have witnessed in a different region of Indonesia as an accredited international election observer. Meanwhile, Vietnam's decentralization, by contrast, has unfolded without the complications of democratization. Vietnam's political system remains one party and authoritarian, although the regime does tolerate talk of democracy with regard to <coughs> commune level official decision making. What do I mean by democratization? I'll use the definition, the process by which a society creates a political system in which leaders are chosen by periodic open and fair elections and subject their decision making while in office to regular oversight and to participation by citizens. Note we should distinguish this parsimonious definition of democratization in the narrow sense of working towards the regular holding of elections from a much broader definition that might be used that might encompass the democratization of political institutions themselves, such as political parties. We also need to be cognizant of the difference between having democratization at the national level and democratization as it is experienced at subnational levels. We tend to be somewhat hazy about our expectations about exactly what we think, how we think the process works at the local level. And here on the far right-hand side of this table, I hope you can see that the story in terms of local level democratization is markedly different in the case of uh, Vietnam than it is in the case of Indonesia. Indonesia has free election of legislators, is about to hold the first free election of executives in the, on the 23rd of June. 
Um, there's popular participation in legislative elections. There's a high level of party um, uh, competition. Uh, uh, the only uh, thing that is not uh, striking is that there's not much autonomy for local party branches of central parties. I'll mention that in a minute. And you'll see that Vietnam uh, doesn't uh, do very well on any of these measures for democratization. This discussion of democratization and decentralization can be related to my research in the following ways. My research resembles a petri dish biological experiment, where I have two groups of petri dishes. The group that represents districts in Indonesia contains a medium which, according to my thesis, is expected to hinder growth. The group that represents districts in Indonesia, can, uh, sorry, the, uh, that component in this analogy is the democratic character of politics at the subnational level in Indonesia. The group of dishes that represents Vietnam contains a medium that is neutral with respect to growth. Each dish receives the same dose of decentralization, and as this interacts with the different mediums, we watch to see if our expectations <coughs> for growth are met and what kinds of variation we see dish by dish. Before I talk about what successful growth means in this analogy, a few words about the dishes themselves that is, my samples of provinces and districts. Within each country, I chose a sample of subnational governments at the level to which authority was passed by decentralization laws, namely that of the province in Vietnam and of the district in Indonesia. My samples comprising four provinces in Vietnam and five Indonesian districts. <coughs> While I sought some geographic variation within each of the two countries, I selected the province and districts to be as similar as possible to one another in terms of economic resources and economic potential, the quality and availability of their labor force, their topography, the ease of access to major domestic markets and international gateways, and their infrastructure. From these samples, I'm able to report findings based upon comparisons of provinces and districts within the same country and comparisons from one country to the other. My uh, sample in Vietnam includes Phai Zung, which I already mentioned, on the one hand, on the one side of uh, Hanoi, on the other side of Hanoi, Ha Tai province. In central Vietnam, uh, just south of Da Nang, the central city of Da Nang, Quang Nam province. And in the south, just outside the southern city limits of Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon, uh, the province of Long An. In the case of Indonesia, uh, in terms of the districts that I looked at, uh, there are three in, in Java. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, the first is in Bekasi, uh, just outside uh, Jakarta itself, in uh, West Java. Um, uh, in the province of Yogyakarta, uh, the district of Bantul. And in East Java, I've already mentioned uh, the case of uh, Sidoarjo, just outside the virtual city of Surabaya. Uh, moving further to the east uh, in Sulawesi, just outside uh, what used to be Pandang, now Makassar, uh, the district of Goa, and in North Sulawesi, uh, just outside um, Manado, uh, the district of Minahasa Utara. So all of these districts and provinces are just outside major domestic markets. Now, what do I mean by successful decentralization? Returning to the Petri dish analogy, successful growth in the medium corresponds to change in behavior of official decision makers in response to the treatment, i.e., in this case, decentralization, in the direction that at least potentially improves the lives of people living in the particular jurisdiction. I'm looking for changes in the actions of decision makers that are expected to improve economic conditions and to maximize the comparative advantage of their jurisdiction in attracting further investment. Such changes include the adoption of measures to restructure provincial or district government units and services to become more user-friendly for businesses, to improve qu the quality and availability of human resources, for example, the building by the district government of Bantul 
in Indonesia of a satellite city to provide housing for workers in manufacturing plants and white collar workers. To improve infrastructure for new firms including the establishment of serviced industrial zones. To lure businesses from neighboring urban jurisdictions where land costs or negative externalities such as environmental concerns discourage further investment in those jurisdictions. And to proactively seek out domestic and foreign investors. For example, in the case of the Vietnam, central Vietnam province of Quang <coughs> Nam, uh, officials partnered with the regional chamber of commerce to send a delegation to Taiwan and Japan to alert potential foreign investors to the advantages of investing in their province. I registered decentralization as having been successful in a province or district where one or more of these behaviors was observed after but not before decentralization or where more than one of these behaviors were observed after decentralization. So what are my expectations? I chose for my samples, as I mentioned, provinces and districts with conditions most conducive for new investment. Good proximity to major domestic markets, to gateway airports and ports, labor and land availability, and a good level of infrastructure. But my expectation of success in each of these research sites varied based upon the established track record of the provincial or district government, not only in terms of the jurisdiction's record of economic growth in comparison with statistical measures of potential human development, infrastructure and development, but also in terms of the prior reputation performance of the provincial or district government. These are the expectations that I've listed in table two. So the three Javanese districts and one northern Vietnam district uh, province included in my samples had records of growing faster than their potentials would, success, would suggest, certainly faster than comparable adjoining regions and or for having switched on governments. Conversely, the two Vietnamese provinces that are not expected <coughs> to succeed Hate and Long An are widely known to have fallen short of targets and to have underperformed governments, underperforming governments. There's insufficient information for me to have expectations in the other three cases. I've listed them here as unknown. <coughs> okay, what do the data show and how might we explain them? Table three represents my assessment of what has actually happened on the ground. In the Vietnamese cases, provincial governments that performed well before decentralization seem to seize the new authority granted them and to run with the ball. Hai Zum, the, the province I mentioned earlier, is a good example. Creating even more favorable conditions for investment and jobs in their provinces. On the other hand, those governments performing suboptimally before decentralization generally did not take full advantage of the authority decentralization offered them, the case of Long An. Thus, predictions based on prior performance were pretty accurate. Decentralization in granting greater authority to provincial governments accentuated differences that existed already in provincial government performance. These observations are consistent with the assertion that in an authoritarian political system the structure of political elites before <coughs> decentralization shapes likely performance of provincial governments after decentralization. Now by structure of elites I mean not merely their internal relationships with each other and those with other societal groups in the province but also the relationships that these elites enjoy with central elites and hence the extent to which they are more likely to be passive and reactive to look for clues to behavior from above, or innovative and proactive in responding to local potentials. Absence of democratization leaves the structure unchanged after decentralization. What about the data for Indonesia? Does the democratizing medium hinder success? In fact, the actual success assessments in Indonesia appear to depart more from the prior expectations on table two. Democracy does not appear to have an undifferentiated negative impact on success rates in all cases. One district is listed as uh, successful, 
uh, and one uh, moderately so. But it can be shown that democratization contributes to performance that falls short of expectations. On the plus side, the successful cases reflect factors such as having district executives with professional backgrounds in business, or having media and communi community organization oversight of district government budgeting and spending, or positive neighborhood spillover effects from successful neighboring districts, or finally popular participation and transparency in the policy making process, especially with respect to licensing, business incentives, local taxes, etc. But the dashed expectations in the case of Siduarjo highlight the role that democratization can play in undercutting the expected advantages of the district government in creating a favorable environment for investment, where elected district legislators exact what amounts to a toll on the district budget and complicate the budgetary process in non-transparent ways, the resources available for district government are reduced. This is a combination table that combines the tables two and three. Now why are we seeing this outcome? <coughs> it's important to understand the incentives faced by dis district <coughs> legislators. The way in which democratization has evolved in Indonesia has heightened central party elites' roles in manipulating lists and controlling financing and scheduling of local campaign activities, determining who gets elected to district legislatures. This is an obstacle to voter education because there are last minute changes, insertions of figures unknown locally into high positions on party lists, and it's an obstacle to accountability because elected legislators perceive they owe their positions to central party figures rather than to the voters, and they subsequently behave accordingly. It's a manifestation of the continued centralization of party institutions bred of the electoral law's requirements that parties be national in scope in order to place candidates on the ballot in legislative elections at all levels and to nominate a ticket for the national presidential elections. In some ways, this centralization is good for concentrating power at the center. It's not good for subnational government. The decentralization design in Indonesia uh, leaves district governments heavily dependent upon central government to remit revenues for district budgets. Because citizens do not see their elected representatives determining their tax basis or their tax rates, nor do they see them directing the, the collection of taxes from them, this is all determined at the national level by decentralization, the decentralization plan, the citizenry has less incentive to perform the oversight function and does not hold accountable legislators for misuse of funds. This flaw in the design, we might call it representation without taxation, weakens the process of, of decision making and contributes to relatively high levels of corruption in district legislatures. A leading light in decentralization circles, Jim Maynor, argues that having central funding for most of local budgets does not make local officials any more or less corrupt. But I think he fails to take into account the role of elected representatives and their link to central elites. In particular, I expected elected legislators would likely intervene to exert self-preserving and non-productive influence in the new areas of authority enjoyed by provinces and districts, such as in the area of administrative decentralization, such as hiring and firing, contracting authority, and regulatory matters. Uh, and in fiscal decentralization in areas um, such as uh, budgeting. Of course, when casting about for explanations for why the success assessments for the case of Vietnam compared with those of Indonesia uh, differ, perhaps the difference in political regime type between the two countries that I've highlighted here <coughs> might not be the first thing that you would think of. One might think of geographic differences or the history of more dispersed rule in the case of Indonesia, or perhaps the greater cultural and ethnic diversity 
represented in Indonesia to explain the pattern observed. One might be inclined to point to institutional factors, such as the role of the highly centralized Vietnamese Communist Party in Vietnam, which has no analog in the Indonesian context, or to refer to the disciplinary effects of the long wars that the Vietnamese fought against outside occupiers. All would lead one to expect, expect less eagerness on the part of Vietnamese provincial government officials to be aggressive and proactive in wielding powers granted by decentralization, i.e. that the Vietnamese cases would be less successful in the terms that I've used here. As I mentioned in relation to my expectations of my visit to Hai Zum Promise close to Hanoi, we'd expect all of these factors should lead Vietnamese provincial governments to hew fairly closely and cautiously maybe even slavishly, to the central line of the party. Conversely, we'd expect the historical lack of central government or party control in Indonesia to be reflected in district governments there being much more eager to run with the ball, to innovate, to be aggressive in attracting new investment, to be more successful in my terms. In fact, the trends when you compare the Vietnamese cases collectively with the Indonesian ones are in the opposite direction. Those factors which you'd think would work against success in socialist Vietnam do not appear to have the negative effect you would expect. And conversely, those factors you would think would work to encourage success of decentralization in Indonesia's districts seem not to result in as successful outcomes as you would expect. In this penultimate section, I'd like to suggest what we might do with these findings about the confounding effects of democratization on the success of decentralization in the case of Indonesia. Are there aspects of decentralization or democratization that international development assistance, whether from the US Department of State, the US Agency for International Development, or from multilateral I institutions, might help change or improve the situation? First, the impact of democratically elected legislators at the subnational level on the success of decentralization suggests the heightened importance of the upcoming elections in June for subnational executives. Where elected executives can act as a counterweight to wayward legislators, we owe it to them to make sure that their legitimacy is not compromised by a flawed election. International donor support for elections, while substantial in 2004, has trailed off into lukewarm funding for local level elections. There's a substantially reduced USAID commitment to democratization at the local level. But there's a critical need right now for funding for domestic observation efforts to ensure the integrity of the voting at the district and the province level throughout Indonesia. With the key transitional election behind it, Indonesia appears no longer to warrant international attention, and the spotlight and resources have moved to key transitional elections in other places the Palestinian elections, Afghanistan, and Iraq. But the risk in the case of Indonesia that is that rather than representing the culmination of democratization, the subnational elections threaten to compromise the objectives of democratization. Support for elections is in fact simultaneously important, but simultaneously support for decentralization and support for the Indonesian economy. The transformation of the economy relies on the growth of private sector enterprises exceeding the national growth rate. Since decentralization allocates to the governments of districts the primary responsibility for registering, attracting, and fostering the bulk of these enterprises, a great deal economically rides on decentralization and democratization having a positive effect on subnational economies. One might also advocate uh, efforts to reform party institutional structures that encourage the misuse of funds that I highlighted in the case of Siduarjo, and I can point to that in more detail if you'd like in the question and answer. Support for decentralization can also support democratization at the subnational level. An important aspect of the design of Indonesia's decentralization has been the central government's retaining of power to establish tax bases and tax rates. If you retain a highly centralized government with all taxes being collected by representatives of central government and only residual amounts being remitted back to provincial or district governments, then the local elections will have a Potemkin village-like feel. That is, there can be no effective representation without local taxation. 
Subnational legislators must have real power over taxation. The stakes must be real for elections to be real. This highlights the importance of international assistance to encourage not only the decentralizing of government functions, but also of the taxing mechanisms with which to fund them at the district level. Most certainly, there are risks associated with this. But voters will quickly come to appreciate when their elected representatives are misusing the funds generated from taxes they have levied on them. What are the costs if these measures and others to support democratization and decentralization at the subnational level in Indonesia fail? Dashed public expectations of democracy and decentralization in terms of their improving government performance and material conditions in general will encourage elected officials to pursue alternative means of legitimizing their positions within their restive populace. This suggests the heightened potential for inter-ethnic conflict and violence, with attempts to seize control of the pot of public resources and the temptation to marshal thugs or premen as agents provocateurs and vigilantes to accentuate anxiety among ethnic supporters. Put another way, Successive democracy at the subnational level is very important to conflict avoidance because it addresses the tension between the constraints imposed on localities by central, centrally imposed institutions such as taxation, regulation, and centrally appointed officials riding roughshod over local sensibilities and the aspirations of local localities to have local rules. In this formulation, Failures of subnational government performance in policy areas related to economic well-being encourage polarization among ethnic elites as certain local leaders associated with certain ethnic or religious groups wield authority and have control over resources previously controlled by central government and possibly in so doing precipitating inter-ethnic conflict and possibly even violence. This development to the extent that it is a reality as yet runs counter to our general expectation that democracy at the district level, particularly recurrent open contestation for elective office, provides a safety valve for inter-ethnic tensions, especially those that might arrive from abuse of power. In conclusion, I've shown that decentralization has yielded some successes in both provinces of Vietnam and in districts of Indonesia. In Vietnam, I've shown that variation in success, province by province, typically but not invariably, follows expectations based on past economic performance and the reputation for government performance. In Indonesia, variation in success and failure is greater. The findings deviate significantly from expectations derived from past economic performance and reputation. Understanding how democratization is occurring at the subnational level and how it's having an impact upon local government helps us explain some, but not all, of these findings. Elective legislatures typically, though not invariably, exercise their approval authority over budgets, regulatory and planning manners in ways that have made government a whole lot less successful at creating conditions conducive to private sector investment and the creation of jobs. These findings appear to support my thesis that decentralization and democratization are not mutually reinforcing processes. This has two implications, perhaps highlighting the importance of a staged or sequenced approach to decentralization and democratization, first democratizing at the national level, then decentralizing, then de democratizing at the local level perhaps. They also highlight the the need for closer attention to the necessary concomitants of successful democratization, especially having representation with taxation and working out ways to reform party structures and to encourage the oversight function that independent journalists, university research institutes and civil society agents perform to force elected officials to be representative of constituents' views, responsive to societal pressures and accountable to society for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, you mentioned you were fighting a cold and had a scratchy thought, but I thought you did very well. <laughs> um, David Timmerman, I guess you're the only one who doesn't have a scratchy throat up here today. Um, <laughs>
We're pleased to have as a discussant and commentator uh, Dave Timmerman, who is an advisor in the programs for democracy, governance, and conflict um, at um, AID, U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, Dave is a longtime observer and student, uh, an activist uh, in this part of the world as well. Um, he studied and worked to promote political change in Asia for something over two decades. Um, he's worked uh, in addition to uh, at Aid um, at uh, NDU, uh, not sorry, not NDU, NDI, National Democratic Institute, uh, at the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, um, Asia Foundation, Asia Society, um, as well as other institutions known to most Asia watchers. Um, he too, um, like Alistair, has written extensively on the region, including books dealing with the Philippines and Cambodia. Um, Dave, we're delighted to have you here today and turn things over to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, I, I know from my watch that we only have a half hour, so um, I could go on at much greater length um, than I, I probably will, so that you'll all have a chance to uh, get involved in this. Um, I do need to begin with a disclaimer. <laughs> um, I'm speaking very much in my own personal capacity here as a longtime Asia hand, mm -hmm. not as an employee of uh, USAID. Um, uh, USAID doesn't work on decentralization in Vietnam, with the exception of a concern with uh, provincial competitiveness, and I'm not directly involved in our programs in Indonesia, so I want to be very clear that my views are, that whatever I say are my views alone and not those of uh, USAID Washington or USAID Vietnam or USAID Indonesia. Um, ah, there we go. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> what, what, what David said is, uh, for journalists here, you can assume he speaks for President Bush. <laughs> um, also, I just want to say I am a generalist. I'm not a specialist on decentralization or, for that matter, on, certainly not on Vietnam and um, only somewhat on Indonesia, which is probably the reason why Alistair invited me <laughs> to uh, do this, because he knew I would uh, maybe go easy on him. Um, and in fact, I was inclined to until I, um, in our earlier discussions, but uh, now that I've heard the entire presentation, it raises more questions for me than I initially had. So let me, I will just sort of run through a number of issues and questions, maybe some more for the purpose of discussion than uh, anything else. Um, first, I do want to, I, I do want to commend him on the focus on decentralization and subnational governance. This is obviously an increasingly important issue. Um, certainly in Asia, the region that I deal with. Uh, some refer to it as the quiet revolution occurring, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. It, um, the, the move towards greater decentralization around the region, uh, although it varies greatly, um, clearly is having um, or will have a huge impact on politics and citizen participation, clearly on governance, although it may not necessarily or always produce better governance, which is, I think, one of Alistair's points. Um, it's uh, less clear what impact it will actually have on development. A lot of that depends on how it's done. Um, uh, but it is important to recognize that uh, if we look at things like the, the Millennium Development Goals, that increasingly these goals are being um, implemented by and are the responsibility of subnational levels of government, not national levels of government, when you think about health and education, for example. It can, as Alstar has mentioned, um, both either fuel or dampen conflicts. It probably has uh, some bearing on um, state fragility, which is another issue that uh, some of us are concerned with these days. Um, and for all of these reasons, it's of greater importance, uh, or should be, to the uh, donor community. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important topic. Um, those are the nice words. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm uncomfortable, to begin with, with some of the kind of, and, and this may be in the detail, which was not presented, but sort of with setting out certain expectations I mean, I wouldn't necessarily have had those expectations about what decentralization would, would the implications would be in Indonesia as opposed to uh, a very more limited uh, form of decentralization in Vietnam. So to set it up as a sort of expectations and then 
whether success matches those expectations. I mean, I, it, I understand the utility of it, but, but I'm not sure that the expectations would be necessarily that widely held. Um, uh, you did spend some time, Alistair, um, talking about uh, the ways that Indonesia um, and Vietnam are comparable or, or useful for a comparison. Um, I, I accept the basic validity, but I think there are a number of important differences that obviously need to be understood. And I assume in a paper or whatever more, your more elaborate treatment would be, it would include these. Um, I mean, clearly it's a very different context. There's been relative political stability and r relative economic, well, not even economic stability, but rapid ep economic growth in Vietnam during this period, whereas, as you pointed out, Indonesia has been going through multiple transitions, political crises, and that, I think, you know, obviously affects political behavior at the national level and at the subnational level. Um, decentralization in Vietnam has been essentially top-down and, as you point out, incremental. Um, in Indonesia, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's grassroots bottom up, but it's certainly much more broad based um, and in a sense pluralistic than has been the case in Vietnam. Um, it has been very much more incremental in Vietnam and goes back a longer way. I guess you can date it back to 1996 with the, with the changes in budgeting, um, whereas in Vietnam it's been, you know, as everyone knows, a big bang and very, very recently. Um, and on that point, I mean, another fundamental concern I have with with the conclusions you draw are that it's based on a, uh, a, very, a very recent change in Indonesia which may or may not um, hold a lot of validity over another election cycle, for example, or over the next five years. Um, you, you point to it, and, but I think it has to be highlighted, and I, as a non-Vietnam expert, what the role of the Vietnamese Communist Party is, and I mean, this is, a, I would think, a very fundamental difference and the, the sort of dual track form of uh, governance that exists in Vietnam as opposed to Indonesia. And I don't think you mentioned it, but also presumably when it comes to the issue of business, uh, the role of state, ed state enterprises in Vietnam and how the relationships between the state and the party uh, and state enterprises factor in to you know, the, con the conditions uh, for success that you Tried, tried to describe. Um, and uh, one other important difference would, of course, be, and it goes back to this issue of the transitions in Indonesia, um, very different um, local level condition, secu security conditions um, and concerns over conflicts. Uh, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of, in short, there's a lot of context which uh, I'm not sure you, your particular approach factors in adequately. Um, there is also, of course, huge variation across regions, both in, in Indonesia and Vietnam. Um, sorry, I have some sort of comments that I developed before I heard the presentation, then I have four pages during, and I'll try to just touch on a few more of these. Um, Oh, I think, and this to some extent, um, oh, all right, two, a few other important both contextual matters, and I think which uh, pertain to some of the differences between the two countries, which may make the comparison a little more problematic. Um, <clears throat> one is, I mentioned, mentioned it briefly, the, um, the impact of different macroeconomic growth rates on the quality of decentralization and the dynamics of um, government responses to um, to business interests uh, in Vietnam over this i 'm not sure of the exact period we 're talking your research covers but it 's roughly seven percent per annum uh, indonesia 's been half of that, and of course again a, a very profound economic <coughs> crisis during much of it. Another might be and I, again i don 't know whether how you would compare the two or if, if you could uh, if, if there 's anything to be said about different or differential patterns of corruption in the two uh, countries, which may have something to do with it. Um, I've mentioned the party. Lastly, at least from what I had before, um, um, I'm not, well, I'm not sure, I, I raise this as a question, whether what you've done tells us anything about um, differences or similarities in, in um, 
mechanisms for accountability and what role those play. Uh, in Vietnam, I mean, my understanding of uh, how it works with regard to subnational uh, levels of governance is that it's very much oriented towards um, uh, upward accountability. To si almost all, uh, this may be an overstatement, and I'm sure you'll correct me, but most decisions have to be ratified by the next level up, and in fact, then those have to be ratified by the subsequent level up. Very much directed towards upward accountability, with the possible exception of uh, the new grassroots demo democracy decree um, and what happens at a very local level. Um, in Indonesia, I mean, as you rightly point out, <laughs> um, accountability mechanisms are at best much more, much more mixed and fluid. Um, at worst, they may not exist, although I think, I, I actually think some do, and it's not just about legislation, legislation, um, legislatures and elections. I mean, there are other forms of accountability. Um, so, I mean, I would encourage you to uh, explore the significance of that. Um, one or two other points just based on what you've said. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know Vietnam, but I, I have, I did check and some of, the, three of the provinces that you're, um, that you've dealt with according to Asia Foundation research work, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, has those three, Hatai, Long An, and uh, Hai Duong, basic, well, oh yeah, at, at different levels of, um, of uh, this is a survey of economic governance scores, but all three of them, whether they're well performing or poorly performing by your judgment, all fall with, below the average in this survey. So none of them are actually, according to this survey, good performers. Um, its survey, you know, I, I just point that out. Again, back to a little bit about what I consider to be perhaps a bit of a subjective approach to your, your determinants of, you know, what would be a likely um, uh, successful pr uh, province or not. Um, one last point, because I do want to let other people get involved. Um, with r the issue of revenues um, and whether there's taxation with representation, I think and again, I'm not an expert on fiscal decentralization, but this may be a gross simplification of the dynamic. Um, and I mean, for example, I'm, I have a, um, a, a chapter from a soon to be released World Bank um, study on decentralization in East Asia. And they, with regard to subnational fiscal structures, I mean, the categories they use are own source revenues, shared taxes, unconditional transfers, <coughs> conditional transfers, and informal revenues. And Indonesia and Vietnam are all over the map on that. Um, so the fact that a tax base, I mean, if this was your argument, that a, uh, a tax base by itself, a local tax base by itself may be low, um, means that there isn't uh, any incentive to be represented. I'm just, I mean, I agree with Maynard. I mean, we had this conversation. Um, there are multiple sources of revenues that subnational governments access. And um, so it's just not as simple as whether there's a, uh, a local tax base or not. Um, and I think that has implications what your for what your argument is. Uh, lastly, I would just, I, turning to your, um, uh, your larger conclusions, um, I mean, as a observer and practitioner of sorts, I, I don't know anyone who assumes that decentralization is going to be clean or, or easy. Um, and the more um, fulsome it is, which is to say the more democratic it is, and Vietnamese decentralization isn't, I mean, it's, you can question whether it should even be called decentralization. I, I mean, technically, I suppose. Um, I think it's a given that it's going to be messier. And the more rapidly it's done, in the case of Indonesia, the more likely it is to be messy. I mean, they're probably, it's probably the case that incremental decentralization um, uh, is better, and a number of countries pursue it that way. Um, that said, and we, I've made this point, 
donors rarely have any say in the matter. <laughs> I mean, you know, donors did not determine um, the pace of Indonesia's decentralization any more than they determined it in the Philippines or, or in Vietnam. Um, so you're pretty much, um, as a donor, you're kind of left with, a, you know, having to large, unless you're the World Bank or the IMF, perhaps. But when you're a bilateral donor, such as uh, USAID, uh, you rarely are setting the terms of what you're, you're um, reacting to. Um, um, and uh, as far as what you say, suggest about focusing more on subnational politics, um, subnational elections and parties, um, I agree entirely. Um, I think actually there's quite a bit of that, more of that occurring, although unfortunately, uh, as you pointed out, not as much uh, funding is going to this in Indonesia in the immediate future. Um, uh, and that's, that's uh, so you're right, it would be good if there could be more, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. It's not really, the logic of that is not about, you know, deciding that they don't matter. It's a pure and simple a resource constraint. Um, I, and I'm not sure that I, while it's conceivable that a failure at the, with decentralization or local government in Indonesia could result in greater uh, inter-ethnic conflict. Uh, that's, prob that's true up to a point, but again, it's, I think it's important to put it in the context of the fact that a lot of the inter-ethnic conflict that occurred in 98, 99, and 2000 was in fact driven by central power intervention into the locality. So by removing the influence of central <laughs> authorities at the local level, you know, that at least holds the hope of, in fact, uh, l having local authorities better deal with uh, whatever conflicts might arise without having the meddling of uh, national level authorities. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, David. Um, you've given all of us, indeed, a lot to chew on. Um, Alistair, with your permission, rather than ask you to react, I'd like to get a couple of other people involved in this. Um, what I'll do now is recognize maybe three people um, if you will pass a microphone to you, so wait till a microphone comes, if you'll very briefly um, introduce yourself and um, ask a question or make a comment. Um, Alistair will collect three of them and then we'll turn things over to you. So who would like to ask a question? Back here in the back, yes. Uh, wait, we got a microphone coming to you now. Uh, you said we could ask a question or make a comment, right? Yes, yes, but, but like briefly, please. All right, briefly, yes. I'd just like to say that... And if you um, could introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, the, is the microphone carrying? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm Andre Savaggio and a senior advisor for the uh, Fontheim International and all for the Vietnam, U.S. Vietnam Trade Council. But um, I'd just like to comment from my own experience in Vietnam, which includes about uh, 20 years of residence there and 40 years of going in and out, that my own observations certainly support uh, Alistair's uh, main conclusions, and particularly I admire the methodology by which you started and concluded that for, for what you said was counterintuitive, that the Vietnamese decentralization worked uh, maybe more to spur economic growth and everything than you would have anticipated or compared to with Indonesia. I think there's a lot of support historically that you may not even be aware of yourself for how this study came out. Uh, even back in Confucian times, we had a saying, uh, and that means that basically that the, um, how can I say, that the uh, emperor's authority kind of stopped at the village gate, that, that there was a Confucian tradition there. Furthermore, during the war in the South, where I participated in the American War with the U.S. Army for nine years, from 64 to 73, I became aware, I reported that Hanoi would eventually prevail and unite the country under the leadership of the party. I reported that my boss, Colby, before he was the director of the CIA, gave an analysis of why that would happen. Now, there were a lot of reasons, but one, apropos to your presentation on decentralization, was that counterintuitively or different from what Americans picture, the Communist Party of Vietnam actually the party and the People's Army of Vietnam were more decentralized in execution and before an, er an order would come from say the Central uh, <coughs> Committee or the Central Office of South Vietnam, they would go out to local unit commanders, battalion commanders, uh, 
and get input about the situation as it existed as they were uh, fighting in the South to, to unify the country. And then the final operations order that would come out would incorporate these differences. And I just seen, I mean, I represented General Electric there for 10 years. I saw in business decisions, you know, a lot, uh, end users have a lot of power. So there's a tradition that goes um, and complements this kind of flexibility. I won't talk very long, but I just want to support your, your outcome. And Thanks very much. Um, anyone else? Down here in front. <laughs> and then let me recognize now, is there anyone else who'd like to say something or ask a question? All right. Back in the back, uh, Wilson, no, the, the young lady. Yes, sir. David Adams, the Council for International Exchange of Scholars. Um, I want to ask you two interrelated methodological questions. First, why did you choose to focus on attracting investment as your central focus of your research as opposed to public works or education, et cetera? I, I have a gut sense that that may have had more of an influence on some of your outcomes than what is healthy. Um, it seems to me I understand then why you chose provinces that were similar um, in that they were all near centers of growth where they were likely to be focused on investment. But it would seem to me that in exploring this topic, it might have been more helpful to look at provinces that are different in nature to explore how decentralization was working and democratization was working. So those two methodological questions I, I'd like to get a better feel for in terms of how you thought about the study. Thank you. And in the back. Uh, I'm Gina Lambright at George Washington University. And I had a similar question uh, that piggybacks off his idea, just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your expectations about the impact of democratization uh, had you measured successful decentralization differently? Um, if you, for example, if you had looked at education, what would have been the impact of democratization? And related to that, I was curious um, to know a little bit more about the differences in democratization across the Indonesian districts. Uh, I wasn't exactly clear and it was extremely interesting, your conclusions, but it wasn't exactly clear what the differences were that were sort of driving the different differential success of uh, these districts. Um, Alistair, before you respond or comment or react, um, it's my intention, because we're supposed to finish at 5 o'clock, it's my intention to go a little bit beyond 5 o'clock. So I'd, I hope to get to another round of questions or comments. Alistair? Thanks for the, the questions um, and, and the comment. Um, um, one of the things that um, all of the officials that I met in the selected samples in both Vietnam and Indonesia were eager to tell me is that they saw new investment, particularly new domestic investment, as a way out of the fiscal problems that they faced that would give them more flexibility to do whatever they want, whether it would be public works, whether it would be, in the case of Indonesia, rebuilding a decrepit infrastructure of schools. Um, uh, they can, uh, if we take the example of Indonesia, they, they have the authority, that is district governments, have the authority to levy certain sorts of user charges and so forth. And in some cases, those are quite um, uh, oppressive in terms of their impact on rather poor people, but the aggregate amount that a typical district can collect from those little charges is very, very small, and it's not enough to rebuild the school system that was built in the early 70s and is basically falling apart. Um, so why do they want to attract investment? It's because they see it as the goose that lays the golden egg, and once they have the golden egg, once they get a little bit of a gap between what they're getting in locally and what they're having to spend by mandate on salaries, on buildings and so forth, then they want to have the flexibility to put it in areas such as public works or education. Um, as to your question, David, about why not um, choose most different provinces rather than most similar provinces, um, I chose similar provinces because I wanted to eliminate factors such as uh, difficulty of access or um, resources um, from the equation. Why do I want to do this? Because 
many places you visit in, for, for example, north uh, western Vietnam uh, by the Lao border, or in Indonesia, the far extent of Nusa uh, Tenggara uh, Timur, the, the, the eastern part of, of uh, Indonesia. Um, uh, district government and provincial government in these places is fair, fairly much resigned to its state. You know, there's very little that they see that they can do to change the conditions on the ground. So even if you hand them all the powers in the world by means of decentralization laws, they're going to say, well, that's very nice, but where's the money? And there is no money. And so if you travel to, to, to many of these regions and you ask, what are you doing to a district official or to a provincial official, they say, same old, same old. We don't have any more money. Nobody's knocking on our door to come and invest here. We can't go to Ho Chi Minh City and attract investors, or much less Tokyo. So nothing changes. So I tried to select areas in which it, it was quite clear that they had the potential. And just in, to respond to a comment David made, it's true that um, the, 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 ones, the, the regions I chose were not the high flyers. Um, for example, um, Bing Zung, a uh, province just outside uh, Ho Chi Minh City, is regularly identified as a high flyer, a fence breaker, a province whose government is very aggressive and very successful in attracting foreign investment. But this high flying province was a high flying province mm. in 1993, uh, long before the uh, changes that I identify, and is one of a handful of places uh, that have been seen as um, uh, very aggressive for a long time. Um, Gina, in response to your question about um, expectation of democratization on education, the, wa the way I look at it is that um, uh, democratization without accountability is simply sucks resources out of the budget in the way that the, the district legislators in Siduarjo simply said as a toll for you, the district executive, to get your budget passed with whatever it was to do with education, infrastructure, health care, whatever, you have to pay us 40% of the budget even to get your budget passed. So um, uh, uh, it's, it's the accountability aspect of this um, and uh, w whether there is a responsibility in terms of not doing that, um, that that bears on whether education funding is available. Um, differences across um, Indonesian, uh, the, the Indonesian cases that, uh, that I have um, uh, one of the factors that, that I've yet to look into in enough detail is the historic um, pattern of rule um, in uh, some of these districts, um, in especially those in Sulawesi, and how they relate to rule in the, the areas on Java, which were historically very close to the center. Um, uh, it, it's Understanding that history from uh, pre-colonial and Dutch times is an important uh, component to being able to explain their success or failure in terms of being able to use um, the, the powers granted them under decentralization. Okay, anybody else? Uh, one here, two in the back, and three right there. We'll start uh, with this gentleman, and then two over here. <coughs> Can everybody hear? Good. Uh, firstly, compliments on a very stimulating uh, presentation and also the set of uh, comments by our commentator. Uh, my name is Hugh Conway, uh, Industrial College of the Armed Forces National Defense University. I would certainly, not only do I find the research outline intriguing, I certainly hope that it's long range, and that, that uh, by that I mean five over ten, up to five, ten years out into the future to continue to carry collect the kinds of information and documentation that you are collecting and the documentation that you are doing. Uh, my question arises, as, you might as might be suggested by my uh, affiliation, and that is on the security dimension, which David made reference to in one of his comments. I hope that that is an explicit factor that you take into consideration uh, in elaborating on the research design that if there are discrete differences in the security arrangements, either within the individual countries or between, that these would be uh, taken into account. So I think that's probably more comment, but again, uh, thank you very much. I found it intriguing. Thank you. Gentleman in the, in the uh, coat right here, sport coat. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And then the gentleman right behind him next. Uh, Al Laporta from the U.S. Indonesia Society. I, I'm going to try to make my colleague Blair King smile a little bit over there, and and just beg to maybe uh, and maybe this is a matter of nuance. Uh, make both of our uh, our author and our respondent smile a little bit by saying it may be too early to declare success or or unsuccess. Uh, uh, and I think that as we have looked at decentralization in the Indonesian example you really have the the beginnings uh, uh, of real self-rule on on the local levels and some real local initiative beginning to occur. Uh, the, the second thing, and, and, and I think all of the objective factors that have been cited, proximity to major markets, the local or national levels of prosperity, uh, degree of tolerances allowed by central by central authorities are all important, but I think that we have to look at this uh, very much as a process and, and very much a, a work in progress. Uh, and in that regard, I think that I'd like to take a cue from the many people who have worked in decentralization in Indonesia over the years by saying that the local capacity building is what really makes the difference in all of this. Uh, and, and it is uh, not only strategic planning or people deciding what they want to do on the local level, but it's, it's training, it's budgeting, it's personnel policies, it's how they run things, management skills. And undoubtedly, some places are going to have it and some places are not. And uh, so I just want to say that um, while all of this you know, examination is very worthwhile. I think it has to be set in more of an overall context of democratization. Um, Al, you remind me of why I'm supposed to be wearing my glasses. I'm sorry, I simply didn't, can't, can't see that far to recognize you. Uh, excuse me. My name is Gary Bland. I'm at RTI International. Um, I, I guess my question is whether you're comparing apples and oranges and it gets gets back to the question of, of uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, the comparative cases here, but uh, particularly when you look at um, um, subnational political autonomy, you're talking about two greatly different cases. I, I don't, um, I, I'm not an expert in Vietnam or in Indonesia, but uh, my sense is, is having done this kind of work in, in, in Latin America and elsewhere is that the political autonomy, especially in a study that frequently references de uh, democracy, democratization, subnational political contestation, if you're, if you're, if you're going to compare uh, Indonesia and, and, and Vietnam, I, Vietnam, is, as far as I understand it, has no local open free um, elections. So there's no political autonomy there, which I think in a study about democracy is very important. I was wondering if you, you shared that view. Well, thanks for those uh, comments, um, uh, Hugh. Um, the um, the security dimension um, is an important difference between Vietnam and Indonesia at provincial and district level because uh, it is always a question, an open question, whether you're talking about security in terms of interethnic uh, conflict, whether you're talking about in terms of or uh, outlaw, as they call it, outlaw activity. Um, uh, this is ever present in districts in Indonesia, but in Vietnam, um, uh, for the most part, uh, the evidence of the national security forces in most places uh, is um, to the extent that uh, that um, limits uh, the potential for, for conflict uh, over resource, et cetera, um, that takes out one dimension of, of local government. Of course, there are exceptions, the Central Highlands, religious issues, um, and some would say that uh, uh, maybe these forces themselves make problems, but uh, that's a different issue. And, and I do hope that this um, uh, becomes, uh, this is both in response to your comment and Al's comment, that uh, um, this um, watching the interaction between democratization and, and decentralization becomes a, a longer term um, uh, enterprise. Um, uh, 
to your comment, Al, about uh, you know it's too early to tell. It, it, uh, somebody's got a good story about that. I, I don't have it to mind, but it's always too early to tell. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, when I, I think on, I, I may be more optimistic, um, uh, given that short time horizon, uh, than some about uh, decentralization. Um, I guess I would hope that you would come away from my talk today uh, with a sense that um, uh, efforts uh, to enhance decentralization by local capacity building, by training, by budgeting, have to be balanced against an understanding of not just the broader context which you emphasize, but actually what are the, the incentive structure that local decision makers and elected representatives face. And looking forward to the election of district uh, executives and provincial governors, um, to really understand what they start to do when they're elected, one's going to have to look at the, at the local level at where are the pressures and the incentive structures that they're responding to? And I don't think we understand those very well at all. Uh, and it's going to explode in, uh, in the sense of there are going to be that many more uh, uh, elected, directly elected executives uh, in Indonesia whose behavior we might find puzzling if we don't try to understand this better. Um, in response to your comment, uh, Gary, um, you know, I'm always facing this ap apples and oranges question, um, and uh, uh, obviously uh, David has a has a fairly uh, strong perspective on that too. Um, by comparing a democratizing country on the one hand and a non-democratizing country, and I'll qualify that in a second. On the other, um, I'm trying to look at what effect if you've got democracy and if you don't. Now. It's it's not strictly true to say that Vietnam doesn't have democracy. As already been mentioned, the the um, democracy decree, Decree 79, which uh, encourages um, broad public participation, requires it. In fact, whether it's actually being implemented is a different matter, but requires broad popular participation and budgeting at the commune level, uh, which is one of the lowest levels of of, of administration in Vietnam. Um, that's certainly uh, a first step. And at the other end, in Vietnam, you have the National Assembly, which is surprisingly strident and aggressive in questioning government ministers, holding them to account, and being televised in doing so. You know, one of the prime time things to do is watch ministers being beat up on TV. But between those two extremes, where the rubber hits the road, where a lot of these economic uh, uh, decisions are being made in, 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 at the provincial government level, there really isn't any democracy. And, and perhaps David's comment is, is well taken that, that those levels are upwardly referential. You know, they're always looking, looking to the center for, for signals. My point is that doesn't always happen, and why doesn't it always happen? And I've tried to develop some explanations for why. Well, thanks, um, first of all, to Alistair and, and to David. If all of you would join me in a round of applause for them. <laughs> I thought it was an unusually thoughtful set of presentations and really terrific uh, questions and responses. So thanks to all of you as well. Um, lastly, thanks to Amy McCready uh, Thernstrom, who did much of the work for us in putting this together. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back here at an early date, and we stand adjourned.